So while we're just sitting here, we're exposed to background radiation all the time. There's radiation due to cosmic rays. There's radiation due to radon. There's radiation due to the rocks in the ground themselves. Hey guys, I'm Brian Nett from HowRadiologyWorks.com. We have bite-sized content for those in the radiology field, especially radiologic technologists. One thing we want to talk about today is background radiation. If that kind of material is interesting to you, click below on subscribe and then click on the little bell icon so you can get notified when we have more bite-sized content in radiology. And background radiation, specifically, especially if you're in the United States, the number three millisieverts is the one thing I want you to remember out of today's video. There's a lot of good information there, but just the number three millisieverts. So three millisieverts per year, that's the background radiation level, and that's the number you should be able to remember. So at a high level, you can compare when you hear numbers of dose level, and you can compare those to the dose levels that you're getting on diagnostic equipment. Because while the type of radiation is different, the radiation exposure rate is different, there's a lot of differences, and we're not saying that those numbers are exactly comparable in terms of risks of any specific disease or any specific outcome. It is valuable to know that we are all exposed to radiation. We are exposed to ionizing radiation all the time at some level, and that we want to have some reference to compare our imaging dose to, and that background radiation dose serves as a good reference for comparing our imaging dose. Again, we're starting now. So we're going to talk about a few different types of radiation exposure sources that uh, occur. So one of them is cosmic rays. So there's, there's different types of cosmic rays, but if you look at this, this picture in the background here, for instance, cosmic rays coming from the sun are coming towards the earth. So this is the earth right here. And the earth is a big magnet. That's why compasses work. And that's why we have a North Pole and a South Pole. And because the earth is a big magnet and that big magnet is spinning, what happens is there's actually magnetic fields going around the earth. And those magnetic fields will take charged particles and they'll direct charged particles such that the charged particles would preferentially come in towards the poles of the earth. And that's because that's where the magnetic field lines will direct them. So if, if they come in and they, they try and enter right at the equator, it's gonna be much more difficult. Whereas if they come in towards the poles, it's gonna be much more easy to penetrate the Earth's magnetic field. So that's the reason why cosmic radiation is higher at the poles that's due to the Earth's magnetic field. And one thing that's a pretty cool feature about this radiation is called the auroras. Like if you've heard of Aurora Borealis, for instance. So these are things that occur in the northern and southern poles. And it's basically just what I was talking about, where you have those charged particles, such as protons, coming from uh, the, what's called the solar wind. And those particles, depending on what they interact with in, in the atmosphere, for instance, oxygen or nitrogen, so depending on which element they're interacting with and at which height they're interacting, that will determine which color you're going to see during one of these auroras. But at a high level, what you're seeing is the ionization of things in the atmosphere due to these cosmic rays. So you're going to be experiencing higher radiation if you go to see the Aurora Borealis because there's more background radiation at the poles. Additionally, radon that you inhale 
is actually the largest source of background radiation exposure in the U.S. And if you look at it, we're looking at in the world, if you average over the world, it's about 1.26 millisieverts of exposure for the average person in the world due to inhaling radon. Whereas in the U.S., that's a little bit higher. So it's about 2.2 millisieverts, and then it's a little bit lower in some other areas, such as Japan. And so if we look at all the different radiation sources, actually, like we talked about, radon is actually the largest radiation source. And then after that is the medical imaging, actually, in terms of the radiation exposure to the population. So things such as CT, nuclear medicine, fluoroscopy, standard radiography, these have exposure. And cosmic rays, for instance, like we talked about as well, has a significant fraction here of the overall exposure to the population. So the takeaways here are that medical does have a significant fraction of radiation dose to the population and that radon is actually the largest source to the population. And if there's one number to take away, it's that if you add up all those background radiation, on average in the US, it's about three millisieverts. So background radiation is three millisieverts. So that number is gonna be used frequently in the upcoming slides when we compare the radiation dose for standard exams. We compare that to the background radiation and that's using this three millisieverts number. So if you live in Colorado or New Mexico, it might be higher, might be four, 4.5 millisieverts. But on average, three millisieverts is the number for the US that we wanna remember. So for abdominal imaging, here's some standard abdominal imaging procedures and the, they are associated radiation doses. And this is from radiologyinfo.org. So it's through the RSNA. And this, for instance, the CT of the abdomen and the pelvis, about 10 millisieverts for an abdomen pelvis CT. And like we just said, three millisieverts is one year of background radiation. So it's three and a third years. So if we just round that to the nearest years, we're looking at about three years of background radiation for an abdominal CT. And then for the pelvis, if, if we have it with and without contrast for that abdomen pelvis, then it'll be twice as much as that. So 20 millisieverts, which again is seven years. CT colonography, six millisieverts. That's about two years. Just all we're doing is taking these numbers in the middle and then dividing them by three to get about two years. And we can see that for each of these x-ray procedures, Again, we're at those similar dose levels where we're looking between one to three years for these abdominal imaging procedures in terms of a comparable time of background radiation. Bone imaging is the next thing that we wanted to talk about. So here's some standard procedures in terms of x-ray imaging. If you're taking an x-ray of the extremities, this radiation dose is quite low Point zero, z sorry, 0 0.001 millisieverts. So that's equivalent to about three hours of background radiation. So you'll have an exam. The exam you'll be exposed for a very short time, but you're still getting a radiation dose, which is equivalent to what the whole body gets in, in about three hours of um, standard living in the United States. And then bone densitometry, also the same, about three hours of uh, background radiation. And a spine x-ray, about six months of background radiation. Then head and neck, if we look at a standard head and neck CT, we're talking about two millisieverts. And that's comparable to about eight months of background radiation. 
and a head CT if you do it with and without contrast. Again, that would be about twice as much, so about four millisieverts. So that's about 16 months of background radiation. Spine CT, six millisieverts or about two years. And then in the chest, if we look at chest CT, about seven millisieverts, so that's about two years, a little bit more than two years. And a lung CT for screening, 1.5 millisieverts or lower, which is six months. And then a chest x-ray, about 10 days of equivalent background radiation dose. Cardiac CT, so these numbers are a little bit old because the radiation doses in cardiac CT really depend on the equipment and the type of acquisition that's being used. So frequently on modern scanners, the numbers we're seeing are much lower than this. For someone of medium to small body habitus, it is not uncommon to have below one millisievert cardiac CT exams on state-of-the-art scanners. But coronary CT, if we talk about coronary CT, uh, using these relatively uh, higher doses, talking about 12 millisieverts, that's comparable to four years of background radiation. And then a calcium scoring exam would be about three millisieverts, again, or slightly lower on a modern scanner. And that's about one year of background radiation. Mammography, again, uh, quite low radiation dose, so about 0.01 millisieverts or about three hours of background radiation dose. And then finally, we'll just have one uh, sample case for a positron emission tomography or PET scan. So the radiation dose there is a little bit higher than these other standard diagnostic scans or about 25 millisieverts, which is about eight years of effective comparable background radiation. So at a high level, what we've gone through is we introduced some different sources of background radiation. Those different sources of background radiation add up to the number we wanted to remember, which was three millisieverts. So three millisieverts of background radiation. And then we took some basic publicly available data for the doses if you go to radiologyinfo.org, you can see that and download that data as well. We took that publicly available data for standard doses in CT and X-ray exams, and then we compared that to the amount of time of background radiation, just so that we can get a feel for the background radiation and how that compares to the radiation doses of these exams. Thanks for sticking around. You now know all about background radiation dose levels. Something else in terms of radiation biology that's interesting is the high level overview of the biology of radiation biology. So check out that video right over there.